impossible. Last month, London suffered its most devastating fire since the Blitz. Get out! Get out! Fire! These are the London firefighters who ran into the Grenfell Tower, risking their lives to try to save hundreds of people. After 30 years in the London Fire Brigade, I didn't ever expect to see anything like that. And I pray to God I never will again. This is the first time they've told their story. You can hear people screaming for help. It was dreadful. She needs help! I'm dead! It was horrific. And it did, did mess me up a little bit, if I'm honest. Mess me up a little bit. We have been following the London Fire Brigade over the last year. In this day and age, you could be turning up to anything, from a gas explosion to a terrorist attack. Extend! As they responded to emergencies across the capital. We need to get some water down here. Get down! We have a large possibility of an explosion. For the first time, firefighters are wearing body cameras and filming themselves on the front line. Here, 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 here. We will see what they see. Fire is a killer. It's a breathing, living thing. These are the men and women whose job it is to run towards danger. OK, gentlemen, you are getting this. When most of us run away. We had no intention of coming out of there until we'd saved as many people as we could. And it, if it was going to collapse, then we were going to die trying. Hello, Fire Brigade. All 999 calls for the London Fire Brigade come through a control centre in Merton, south-west London. Fire Brigade. At 12.54am on the 14th of June, an unusually high number of calls started coming in about an incident in West London. Multiple fire engines were dispatched to a fire in a fourth-floor flat in Grenfell Tower in North Kensington. Jesus Christ, mate. Wait, is that, that's not a real block of people in it. So I was at home in bed before the call. Uh, a pager went off at 0118 to inform me of a flat fire at Grenfell Tower. Borough Commander Richard Welsh was one of the first senior officers to arrive, whilst fire engines across London raced to the scene. That's a real block. Jesus. How is that possible? Jumped up all the way along the Initially, they had six machines there. Then they asked for eight, and then 10, and then 15, 20, and then 25. So I'm hearing that on the way there. So it's becoming it's really clear that we've got something, you know, quite a serious incident going on. Oh my. Can you believe this, Paul? I know Grenfell Town. I've been there before. And as I was approaching it, um, I just knew we had we had probably the job of our lives on the go, because already I could see fire from lower floors, and I couldn't believe I was looking at fire to the top floor. Oh, this whole building's burning, man. But never seen anything like that, ever. The fire was changing; it was moving rapidly. Someone right at the top, man. Bro, there's still people in the building. I know there's still people in the building. At 1.30 in the morning, fire crews had been fighting the fire for over half an hour, and the scale of the challenge was becoming clear. Grenfell Tower was home to at least 350 people. One of the first things I did was actually to clear out a major incident. Because I knew we were going to need a lot of help. You can hear people screaming for help. Help her! Help her up there! She needs help up there! There were people making signals for help. He's made the rope from his blankets and he sent it down. Personally, I could see faces at the window. Um, I could see the, the torches and the, and the calls for help. Look, 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 there's someone in the top with his chain in his leg. Please. SOS, SOS. It, it, it was dreadful. There's hundreds of people in there. 
men, women, children were coming out, fully sooted, black. They'd been through a layer of smoke in complete distress. There were people running out who had lost contact with loved ones. Some people were even trying to get back in to try and forget to their loved ones. There were firefighters who were bringing casualties down the staircase who were clearly exhausted, but wanted to get back in there and don't, don't try and rescue more. In a tower block incident, firefighters establish a bridgehead. This is an operational hub actually inside the building, two floors beneath the fire. It was from here Borough Commanders Richard Welsh and Pat Goulborn helped run the operation. Probably the busiest bridgehead I've ever seen. There was so much going on. We had our hoses going up the staircase. We had people trying to get out and coming down the staircase. We got firefighters going up the staircase. And the staircase is filling with smoke. So the priority really was to try and reach the flats we knew we had people in. The issue we had was the intensity of the fire. After a couple of hours, 40 fire engines and 200 firefighters were now on the scene. In parts of the building, the fire was reaching temperatures of 1,000 degrees. It was dark, the visibility was poor, it was hot, but the intensity of the heat was increasing rapidly, floor by floor. It was like you're walking into a red, hot oven. And I can only describe the things I saw as horrific. Yeah, it, it, was, it was horrific. To get to the residents trapped across 24 floors, firefighters had to push themselves and their equipment to the limits. Our breathing apparatus doesn't last forever, so we have to work out where we can send people to, how far they can get. You know, people, firefighters have difficult decisions to make. I mean, very difficult decisions. You know, can you get them all out? Do you get some people to stay? Do you come back with some people? But before you get there, you can find a casualty and you've got to pull them out, or do you leave them? Do you send them out on their own? But this scale, Grenfell, was massively different to to any other job in terms of the volume of people. The job was even more challenging because there was only one staircase for the whole building. On the, on the staircase, there was quite an overpowering, deafening sound of screaming, um, which was tough. There was a lot of falling debris. We had concerns about people who may jump to try and get away from the fire. Um, that just drove us on. Just drove us on a bit. That, that when you can when you can hear those, those screams, that that's, you've got you've got you've got to get there. You've got to get there. I remember carrying um, a young baby, probably two or three years old, and the mother. I picked him up from the third floor stairwell. And, uh, and she was just beside herself. In the midst of the inferno, the very structure of the building became unsafe. Get right back! Get right back now! For your own safety! There was the potential for the boom to collapse. You can hear bangs all the time, parts of the building falling down. So, you know, that's going to put an element of fear into anyone. We had no intention of coming out of there until we'd saved as many people as we could. And it, if it was going to collapse, then we were uh, going to die trying. Every single person within that building was willing to lose their own life to try and save others. Every single person. Outside, the falling debris was seriously hampering the rescue operation. All the debris is falling on the floor, catching fire. The debris was not just falling down the side of the building, it was being caught in the wind and it was travelling some distance. We had an aerial platform up on, on the uh, east side of the building when we were there, providing some water, and, and it was a very dangerous place to be. Oh, yo, 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 yo. 
and in fact there was a crew with a handheld hose who were firing water over his head to try and deflect, deflect debris from falling on him. As dawn approached, four hours after the first 999 call, the fire was still spreading. There was a point where Pat and I had a wordless moment and just sort of looked at each other and we both knew that we were really struggling. We were really struggling to, to beat the fire. But the priority for us was there were people in there that needed us and, and we were the only people that were going to be able to help. Against all odds, the rescues continued. One of my crews, between two of them, they were carrying a woman, and then they come across a woman and a child and managed, again, I don't know how in all that heat and smoke, but managed to bring the two women and the child out with one carrying the child and sort of between them supporting and dragging the women down the stairs. And throughout the night, we kept bringing people out of there, but we were just permanently getting beaten back by the fire. It was white hot. They were pinned to the floor. It was so hot. Heat rises, the temperature at the top of the room, if they'd have stood up, they would have instantly caught fire. And people were climbing the stairs and going onto the landings to, to carry out rescues on their bellies because it was that hot. We knew that there was people that we were desperate to get. I had them in my head. I think I've still got them listed in my head of the people I want to get to. You always think you're going to win. Simple. I didn't even notice it was daylight. Um, I lost all track of time. You know, there were firefighters laying about with haunted looks in their eyes. After 30 years in the London Fire Brigade, I didn't ever expect to see anything like that. And I pray to God I never will again. In the days following the tragedy, the fire service and the police started the painstaking process of recovering the bodies of the victims. I was sent specifically to a floor to deal with a number of casualties, deceased, and bring them back down. Every single room looked like a bomb had gone off in there. The thing with this, to be honest, is the fact that, you know, it's happened and it did, did mess me up a little bit, if I'm honest, and um, messed me up a little bit. At least 80 people are currently thought to have died in the tragedy. It's the UK's biggest loss of life in a fire since the Second World War. The final death toll remains unknown. I've been back and uh, I went up to the wall that they've got and paid my respects, for it, which I think a lot of firefighters did. Um, and while I was there, I spoke to some people in the community and they were just, you know, they were amazing. I can't imagine what it's like for them. How does a community deal with something so, so big? You know, you know deep down professionally, you know deep down you did everything and more. But it doesn't make you feel any better. There is a feeling of being extremely proud of what we did and how, how hard everyone worked. But there's also that horrific feeling of, of... we didn't get everybody. And we tried really hard. Tragedies on the scale of Grenfell Tower are once in a lifetime incidents. But for all of us, an ordinary day can take a dangerous turn at any time. And when it does, London Fire Brigade is on the front line of keeping over 8 million Londoners safe every day. They deal with over 20,000 fires a year. Hello, Fire Brigade. Hello, and um, we have a fire in our kitchen in our oven. 
All incidents start with a 999 call to the control centre in Merton. Hello, Fire Brigade. How can I help you? Oh, hi, Anne. There's a large fire. Can you see what's on fire? Uh, yeah, it's a block of flats, which uh, is burning vigorously at the moment. How tall is yeah. it? Like a high-rise uh, block? Three-storey. We've got a fire engine on way. Thanks okay. for calling. With a call about an explosion in a block of flats, the nearest stations are automatically alerted. And firefighters are out of the door in 60 seconds, including crew manager Alan Jones, a few miles away. We don't know what's exploding. In this day and age, it could be turning up to, from a gas explosion to a terrorist attack. The biggest concern is to make sure everyone is safe and well and away from the incident. Breaking news in the last few minutes, a explosion at a block of flats. Police have yet to confirm the cause, though inquiries are underway. Local road closures are in place. It's after five o'clock. The fire is spreading and there's every likelihood that people are trapped inside. 70 firefighters and 10 fire engines from local stations are racing to the scene. With eight flats already destroyed, hundreds of tenants have been evacuated. We've got babies in that block, we've got elderly people in the block. There's all sorts of people in there, no one needs this. No. I've never felt anything like it in all my life, to be honest. Like, there was a rumble through the whole building, you know? It's impossible to know if everyone is out which is added pressure for Alan and the crew to stop the fire. The structure's been uh, compromised on the side as well now, not just the back here. And it looks like the fire's starting to spread to the loft space. So we might have to peel the roof off. Yeah. Crews are pushing the fire back, but with smoke masking the flames, they need thermal cameras to find it. In house fires, most deaths are caused by smoke inhalation. It can kill in a matter of minutes. If anyone's trapped inside, firefighters must act fast. Crews are preparing to go in. Firefighter Greg Lessons is on the scene and responsible for monitoring his team's air supply. Each tank only lasts 31 minutes. When you think people are in there, it changes absolutely everything. It goes from just a building that you could possibly save to a life or lives that you could save. As they get closer to the fire, temperatures are well over 100 degrees Celsius. As his team searches through the smoke, it's an anxious wait for Greg. When you're in a smoke-filled room, there's zero visibility. You literally cannot see the hand in front of your face. And it's the most disorientating feeling there is. It's quite a lonely feeling, actually, because you're completely detached from the outside world. Whilst the search continues, the paramedics treat those that have escaped. People are walking around in the days, you know, they don't know what's happened. They don't even know they're cut or they've broken limbs and stuff. <laughs> Just a bit of a shock. <laughs> I didn't think we were going to get out. It was hard breathed in, it was burning. <sighs> oh, dear. Failing to find anyone, they're calling in the specialists. It's the belt and braces, it's just around the dog and stuff. Terry Gooding from Urban Search and Rescue. 
at the moment, we're in a situation where we've got one person who's actually still potentially unaccounted for. Terry's partner is a veteran of over 100 search and rescue missions. Kirby, a six-year-old Springer Spaniel. What we're going to do is we're going to send a dog in there who's trying to pick up human scents. That will give us a definite answer as to whether anyone's in there. The dogs are highly trained, even down to the fact that they wear little boots on their feet so that they don't injure themselves on any sharps, glass. <laughs> They're trained to work in those environments, pretty much like you'd see in an earthquake situation. Search dog, grab it me. The dog will be looking for human scent. It will then indicate to the dog handler that it's got what we call a hit, which basically means it's found someone. And it's not just the residents the firefighters are struggling to find. The main bit of the fire is in this cavity wall. It's got in between the skin and the internal cavity. We've got timber, brick, insulation. What's, what's happened is this, the uh, insulation between the, the brick and the timber is smouldering. We're going to lose the whole lot, aren't we? We're going to lose the whole lot. With flames now hidden inside the walls, crew manager Joe Munro is going up on a 106-foot aerial platform to find the fire. They need to get to the seat of the fire, brick by brick. Smoke is hot, and you've got that coming out at you. That's the horrible thing with fire. At the end of the day, it's a beast. It will grab whatever it can and not stop until we get there. As Alan controls the aerial platform, Joe hoses inside the wall with 2,300 litres of water per minute. We are breaking the back of it now. So there's a lot of smoke coming out still. It's sort of confined to a small area, and with two of you up there and the equipment, it's not, not a very big cage. So you're limited to your movement. It seems like they've sort of flooded it from above now, so it's a structural nightmare now. At the moment, it's a There may be people still inside, and a final search is needed. This is a job for the more light-footed member of the crew, Kirby. If he catches a human scent inside, he'll stay in the building and bark to alert his handler, Terry. Well done, you. No, nothing pulling him in there. All right. Uh, we, that pretty much gives us the confidence we need to uh, say that there's no-one else in there now. A number of flats are condemned and the residents will have to leave. Yeah, just want to the scum, these ladies. Uh, can you just flash it that way so I can see the brook on my leg? <laughs> Right, if you think of what you need, did you find your cat? I found my cat, he's in here. <laughs> he's called Nelson. Are you happy that you found him? Oh, I'm so happy. Over the moon. Really happy. You're being so kind, thank you. Where are you going tonight, do you know? Her holiday in, they booked us in. OK. Thank you so much. Honestly, really appreciate it. The cause of the explosion is part of an ongoing investigation. Have a fly, mate. Well done. It's been a challenging five hours for Alan and Joe. Every fire is different. Every day is different. Anything can happen. This is when we all come together and everyone starts working well together. If I didn't love my job, I wouldn't do it. The money's not great, but uh, the reward is unbelievable. Although tragically people lost their homes, 
the brigade was able to ensure there were no fatalities. Hi, brigade. Yes, um, I'm standing on the main road and I can see it bellowing from behind the houses and like the whole street is like kind of covered in smoke. The London Fire Brigade responds to over 20,000 fires each year, caused by everything from a candle left burning to an electrical fault. Oh yeah, can I have a fire brigade cars on fire? But more than ever, the brigade is being called to road traffic collisions. This year, they've attended four and a half thousand. Almost daily, specialist units are deployed to cut someone out of a car, as well as carrying out many other rescues. These units are strategically spread across London alongside conventional firefighting teams, ready to rush to an accident at a moment's notice. This unit in Battersea, South London, is run by Edric Kennedy McFoy. Being in peak condition is key for their job. Tom, he keeps on telling me, stop growing your biceps. These are just natural. I hardly train bike, but they just grow. <laughs> you like that? Come on. All of London's 102 stations are equipped with gyms. We've got to make sure we're operationally ready for any eventuality that we may be faced with. <sighs> Firefighter fit, always ready. <laughs> Firefighter McGuire. Sir. Firefighter McDonald. Sir. Firefighter O'Connor. Sir. Today, Edric's starting a shift with his Blue Watch team. Firefighter Tal. Firefighter Moyne. Sir. Blue expression. Two Jews for that. Station manager Dave Waterman is prepping his crew ready for the first call. Well, we've just come on duty, um, so we're testing all the equipment on the appliance, doing inventory, make sure everything's there. Everyone's getting ready, so uh, you see Dan over there. On the other side of the pub ladder there, you've got his twin brother, Mark. We sometimes mix the two of them up, quite obviously. That's Tom. Tom's the driver of the pump ladder. And you can see he's a fine figure, a man, look, look, you know, officer and a gentleman. Mind your chief. Apart from that, he's already, he's already <laughs> a go, right. Edric heads up one of the three specialist rescue units serving London. This is it right here, the fire rescue unit. This is my baby. It isn't your normal pumping appliance, so we don't carry any water. What we do have is specialist equipment. We specialise in road traffic collisions. We've got a boat for water rescues. We deal with everything, but obviously we've got no water um, media to extinguish any fire, because that's not what we do. When people are trapped, rescue units across London get the call. And one has just come in. It's a news breaking. Five people trapped, 40 people injured after a tram overturned in a tunnel in Croydon, which is down in South London. This coming from the LFB London Fire Brigade. We'll get more details on that story just as soon as we can. Stations around the capital are being mobilised. The tram crash they're heading to is the UK's biggest transport incident since the 7-7 bombings and involves a significant loss of life. It was shortly after six o'clock in the morning. 999 crews from across South London converged on Sandylands. In Croydon, South London, a tram has crashed. It's the biggest transport incident the emergency services have had to deal with in over a decade. I am just east of Croydon in the Sandylands area. I'm standing just south uh, of a huge police cordon. It's got police officers, fire engines, the lot. There are reported fatalities and many injured. Hundreds of firefighters from across London are on the scene. Nine miles away in Battersea, crew manager Edric and his specialist rescue unit are being mobilised. There are quite a few trapped casualties and 
overseas, so we need to get there ASAP and do whatever we can to assist. Edric's team is heading to the crash as it enters a delicate phase. Their specialist skills are needed to retrieve the deceased from the wreckage. Just because the person's deceased doesn't mean you can just, you know, pick them up and just throw them in a bag. We do everything, you know, carefully and with love. Make your way up there and basically see where the guy's standing in the orange. Yep. Straight down there and that's where the incident is. Okay. okay. In my 11 years in this job, I've never witnessed anything on this scale. I've never been to a derailment before. It's just my first one. Good morning. A number of people have been taken to hospital with injuries, and sadly, we can say that there has been some loss of life. We are working hard to assess... There are 51 people injured, and the death toll stands at seven. The London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, arrives to lend support to emergency workers. Many have already played their part, but the challenge for Edric and his team is just beginning. Right now, there are, I believe, two casualties, or two victims still trapped. So we just need to release their bodies so we can send them off, basically. Yeah. What's the plan for lifting it? Yeah, bags on the side. Yeah. Lift it out, clear the bodies. I think it's probably going to be about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, possibly going on two hours even before we do that. Yeah. Battersea Blue Watch manager Dave Waterman oversees the teams. We're going to use heavy lifted airbags to slightly lift the tram, pivot it on, the, on one point on that side uh, to give us enough space to retrieve the casualties. At the end of the day, that's someone's mum, dad, brother, sister. I like to show respect and deal with them as if I was dealing with one of my own. Is everyone ready? Rise! It's now 5 p.m., 11 hours after the tram derailed. Got broken glass everywhere, twisted metal, the track itself. We've got to be very careful in our lift and in our removal of that casualty because the last thing we want to do is cause them any more harm. <coughs> the fact that it's in a precarious position means that the distribution of the weight is going to be all over the place. Anything can happen. We've lifted the tram by three or four inches, which has given us enough room there to free the two casualties, the final two casualties. One of those has just been released and recovered from the train, and the final one is about to be recovered. gets me is the fact that, you know, they woke up this morning and they didn't know that today was going to be their last day. They didn't know they, were going to, they weren't going to see their family again and they didn't know they were going to meet such a tragic end. And, you know, the fact that, you know, something like this can happen to anyone, it's quite scary, actually, isn't it? It was very graphic. Those are images that, you know, will stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, I just want to make sure, guys, because I know you've been here a long time, and I really appreciate some of you have been here since the early hours of this morning. Um, we've obviously taken out the last of the fatalities. I just wanted to get everyone together and just obviously very appreciative of your work. You've been here a long time. Yeah? Excellent. Let's go. I'm sure we'll go back to the station now and we'll talk about it. And, you know, that helps to ease what you've seen. But, you know, this is life and death.
cloudy weather, mostly clear for bonfire night, some patchy cloud and light winds, a low of four degrees Celsius. After years of safety campaigns, bonfire night is often surprisingly quiet for fire crews. But not this evening. A call has just come in. Hello, fire brigade. Hello, it's a really emergency. We've got fire everywhere coming up. Yeah, OK, so we're on our way now. There are reports of a large fire in a flat in North London. When there's a big incident, borough commanders like Richard Welsh, also known as Rocky, are called in. As a group manager, I'll go to incidents of four fire engines or more. From the time that the pager goes off, the adrenaline starts. You're thinking about what you expect to see when you get there. We know that this is a, a fire in a domestic property, and the fact that we've got six fire engines there means it's quite a substantial fire. As Richard arrives, there are now eight fire engines and nearly 60 firefighters at the scene. Guys, can we get a map up of this area so just so we can see? With any serious incident, operations are run from a mobile command unit. From here, Richard coordinates the firefighters and local traffic. Station. Yeah. And this is a 24-hour route. This road here. All walks into that lower ground. It's not going either side. And the lower ground's gone. Yeah. So there's nothing to save down there. So you just go right through. This basement. Yeah. Is that one big room? It goes right through the back. If it does. I don't think it's one big room. If we can get a flow through here, we can push it all out. Just keep through getting there, pushing out the back door, get the smoke out. We've got a fire on the lower ground floor and, the, and the, the first floor. As you can see, the smoke is getting pushed right through the building. As an incident commander at my level, we're quite often not the one actually in the throat of the fire. It's a lot of responsibility. We have injuries, so it's a dangerous job. But my responsibility is to make sure that the firefighters go home at the end of the day. Flames are now raging at the rear of the flat, but fire engines can't reach it. West Hampton's off the UTR this evening. We need to get some water down here. We need to get two machines at the front of the building over. Fire spreads in seconds, so we need to get water into that premises as quickly as possible. Okay, we've got no water here. We've got PA. We need a machine to supply water. But at the minute, we don't know if anyone's inside or, or what's caused the fire. I hope to God there's no one in it. It's bonfire night. A flat in North London is ablaze, and it's feared the owners are trapped inside. The fires spread to the back, but firefighters can't get a pump to it. <laughs> Borough Commander Richard Welsh is overseeing the teams. With occupants missing, he's sending in firefighters wearing breathing apparatus, or BA. <laughs> The windows have failed. Uh, there's a lot of flame coming out of the back. Okay. The problem around the back is access. We need to get a fire engine as close as we can to supply the water to fight the fire at the back. Finally, the crew get some good news. I spoke to a member of the police. They were saying that they spoke to one of the local residents. They believe that the occupiers are on holiday and not in. Being on holiday, they're thousands of miles away. Must be absolutely awful for them, not knowing what's happening to their home. But the danger to other residents is by no means over. It's really important we get water to a fire as quickly as possible. London's a very built-up area, so we have a lot of properties really close together, so fire can spread really quickly. <laughs> Yeah, we're still waiting for water over. Every second counts when it comes to us getting water 
from the hydrant to the fire. Behave, crew. Knock it down quick. Get in as far as you can. Let me know what's going on, and I'll commit. Maybe commit crews above you after it's out. Hey, you got a lot of friends on your left, sir. Huh? Right. On your left. Ultimately, fire is a killer, and it's a breathing, living thing. If you take it for granted, that's when injuries and accidents happen. Richard's team is battling temperatures in excess of 600 degrees Celsius. Yeah, go, go. After two and a half hours of hosing, the flames are finally dying out. It's thought the fire was started by a firework thrown into the back of the flat. Around bonfire night, young people find fireworks quite exciting, um, but they don't always realise the dangers that go with them. And certainly if it's house fires, they lose things that they can't ever replace. And that's priceless. But the blessing really is the fact that nobody was in there, nobody got injured. That's the most important thing. I want to get home. I left the front door open. <laughs> I ran out. <laughs> tram service was back in operation but the area around the derailment remained sealed off as rail accident branch inspectors and forensic teams continued their investigation in Battersea Edric and Blue Watch are together for the first time since the tram crash all firefighters are offered counseling but many prefer to deal with it amongst themselves you'd see that type of incident a handful of times in a 30-year career I struggled a bit yesterday, personally, but, you know, collectively, as a team, we worked well together. And, um, yeah, proud of all of you boys who attended. The thing that gets me is when you see, like, their mobile phones... That's exactly ..and they're on the floor and then they're lighting up with people trying to call them and stuff like that, and obviously mm. you can't touch them. It's just like thinking, like, trying to get hold and find out about their loved ones. Yeah, it's, uh, it just makes it that little bit more personal. And the IDs, you know, yeah, yeah. handbags, Probably identification... You know, when Diva I picked up an ID and just read out the name, it just made it even more real yeah. for me then because, you know, that's a person. Dealing with what we have to deal with, just knowing you've got the support of your, of your colleagues, your friends, you know, behind you, that makes, that makes all the difference. There was a, a, a group of deceased that were, you could see that they were probably standing next to each other on the tram. You may get on the train at the same time, you may see the same people, you know, every day. And now you see these people in that position. It's, uh, it's, it's thought-provoking, you know, but you, c you can't be morbid all the time. You have to, you have to have a bit of... <laughs> Today's a different day. It could happen again tomorrow, and you've just got to make each day count. In this job, camaraderie is very important because, you know, we're a team at the end of the day, and, you know, we've got each other's back. And we get each other through. We had a couple of local residents saw a flash of flame, got a BA crew have gone in. They can't say they're blind. It's worse than putting them in an oven. In Stoke Newington, severe flooding in the area. It's just gotten worse and worse and worse. It's crazy. 
In large containers of liquefied petroleum gas, we have a possibility of an explosion.